Yeah. If they wow. do first, that's good for me, I suppose. Okay. Let's go. My goat. All right, sure. Um, so we can start the timer now. I'm Louis from Team Shimskis, and I'm presenting problem H, magnetic assist. So the problem statement reads as such. Attach one or two magnets to a non-magnetic and non-conductive base such that they attract a magnet suspended from a string. Investigate how the motion of the moving magnet depends on relevant parameters. So some of the relevant parameters we've identified are the magnet positions as well as the magnet strengths. And for the pendulum, the pendulum length and the mass of the pendulum blob and the height above the magnet that the pendulum lies. For the pendulum motion, we're investigating the damping, the frequency of the motion, as well as the chaos and end state, so the basins of attraction and predictable patterns inside of this motion. All right, let's start with an introduction to the problem. So here you can see the problem. So the pendulum going over two magnets. There's two magnets on the base and one pendulum on the magnet. So you can see an interesting chaotic pattern forming. And what happens is that's attracted to um, those magnets on the base. So why is this? So when you have a magnet that's hovering over another magnet and they're in an attracting orientation, what you see is that the magnet on the pendulum will experience firstly a magnetic torque that tries to align that magnet with the exterior B field, as well as the magnetic force that pulls it towards the magnet on a base. This is called the Lorentz force. So to model this magnet interaction, which is crucial to our theory, um, we use the surface currents model which states that um, you can approximate the magnet to being a bound. So there's a ring of currents on the side of the magnet and um, we can calculate the surface current just through this identity on the bottom over there. So with this, um, with this model, we can then simulate the magnetic field of the pendulum on the basis using the bias of our equation. So we do this by integrating across each of those current loops. So um, one integral for going around the current loop and one for going from the bottom of the magnet to the top of the magnet. And we integrate the B field using the superposition, uh, superposition principle. So you can see here our integrated B field. So that shows the B field of the magnet. And we do this using Python number and NumPy to compile the Python code for near compiled performance. And you can see here our accuracy target is roughly in a solution time of less than uh, 50 microseconds. So to compare this to a dipole model, which is a more traditional solution to a problem like this, um, we can see that the current cylinder is far more accurate at closer distances to the magnet. This is because the dipole model um, asymptotes as you get closer to the magnet, since it's an inf infinitesimally small point. So now that we've solved for the B field, we need to solve for the Lorentz force acting on the pendulum that's um, acting on the pendulum. So once again, we just integrate across these current loops, and that gives us this plot over here, which we once again solve with Python. So what we notice here is that, interestingly, not all of the force is directed towards the magnet on the base. And this is um, not what's supposed to happen. So the issue here is that we're not taking into account rotation that's caused by the magnetic dipole moment that we discussed earlier. So to take this into account, we apply Roger Gwiz transformation to the pendulum magnet. So this is just a vector transformation. And we align the dipole moment of the pendulum magnet with the B field of the magnet on the base. This in turn produces this graph, which is much more in line with our, what we experimentally expect um, the force's direction to be. So in this case, you see all of the force pointing towards the magnet on the base. So now that we've solved for the magnet interaction, we can look into the equations of motion of the system. So in this case, we decide to use spherical coordinates because we can keep our constant and therefore um, we limit one degree of motion and we're left with two. Once we do that, we can define phi and theta as such and solve for a basic equation of motion using the Euler-Lagrange equation. Next, um, we account for external forces. So first the gravitational force, then the magnetic force, which um, I will expand on in the appendix, just like Daniel, I suppose. And as well as dissipative forces, which point in the direction opposite to the um, direction that the pendulum is moving. After that, we numerically integrate this using an eight, nine order runge kuda felberg method, which is a derivative of the runge kuda method. So for our experimental, we use um, a top camera on top of the pendulum, which sits on top of the magnets on the base. So the benefits of this is that we only need one camera to track the 3D position of the pendulum. So here you can see our actual uh, experimental setup. We have a DSLR camera on the top, as well as a ring light directly at the lens for lighting. And we pass this through USB and pass it to OpenCV for processing. So how do we process this? So we use quite a few computer vision trick, uh, tricks to get an accurate reading of the pendulum. And so first of all, we use a large aperture. So the reason why we use a DSLR is because the aperture can go to f over 1.4, which means that we remove the suspension from the image. Next, we clean the background by using a white paper and we use an observer point light source, so the ring light at the lens, to remove any shadows in the image. After this, we apply an edge detection alg algorithm and then um, average the high contrast pixels in the image to find the position of the pendulum. 
So once we have the pixel position of a pendulum, um, it's quite simple to find the 3D position simply by using um, a trigonometric transform of the pixel position, which is here. And to calibrate this to make sure this is accurate, we use a ruler and um, we just check the experimental data points against what our computer vision says it should be. And you can see there, there that there's a very accurate camera tracking here. Next, to characterize the important parts of our system, we characterize the magnet using the mobile free axis Hall effect sensor, which we find the um, B field of the magnet at given distances away. And then we fit our um, magnet moment using least squares regression. Next, we fit the damping of our pendulum. I'm oh, sorry, we find the magnetic dipole moment to be 0 0.987 ampere meters squared. And next, we fit the damping. So here we um, fit the damping by fitting the Coulomb friction and the laminar flow friction, as well as turbulent friction to our experimental data, as well as we fit our eddy current for um, when we have a magnet. So here we find that our fitted has roughly RMSC of 0 0.03, which means that's accurately solving for our pension. All right, now we can get to the interesting part, which is the regimes of the system. So in this presentation, I'll be going over the two regimes stated by the problem statement. So firstly, we have the single magnet regime where there's a single magnet on the base. And for this, we'll be analyzing the frequency of the system uh, in relation to various parameters. And next, we'll be analyzing the double magnet regime. So this regime is far more chaotic, which I'll get into later. So first with the single magnet regime. So here you can see um, the single magnet regime. This is experimental data. I'm animating this after getting the coordinate. And you can see um, the motion. So I've cut out the large portions for brevity, but we'll get into those later. So what you see is that first you have this oscillation phase um, where it acts as a simple pendulum. The frequency of the oscillation stays constant as it orbits it in a circular orbit. After that, we have an interface where the frequency that's oscillating at rises sharply. And lastly, you have a trembling phase where the frequency stays roughly constant. So for the symbol pendulum phase, as I mentioned, um, it just looks like this, a normal pendulum oscillation. For the interphase, you see that the frequency increases across time as the amplitude goes smaller. And for the trembling phase, you see that the frequency stays constant while the amplitude is very small. So how do we explain this? So for a simple pendulum, the magnetic force is quite small because magnetic force scales with one over um, r to the power of four. So in this case, magnetic force is basically negligible and it acts as just a simple pendulum um, or oscillating around the magnet. Next, in the interface motion, as it gets closer, so as theta decreases, the magnetic force sharply increases, causing the effective centripetal force acting on the system to increase, thus increasing the frequency of oscillation. Lastly, at the tremble motion, um, the magnetic force asymptotes because there's a height above the other magnet, and therefore the centripetal force also um, asymptotes. And this is why the frequency plateaus at a given point. So here you can see the frequency um, theoretical comparison between our simulation and our experimental data. And you can see a very strong fit between um, the amplitude versus time. So here's an RMSE of 0 0.023. Next, for comparing the time versus frequency. So this is what we were talking about before, the different frequency phases of this motion. Um, you can see that our theoretical also matches very closely with our experimental and also exhibits the same, um, it exhibits the same modes of motion. So unfortunately, we can only have one data point for magnet strength, because when we stack more magnets on top of each other, the effect of, um, the mass of the magnets also changes. So we can't keep um, one variable independent of the other, but we do see that this fits very closely with uh, our third line, our single data point. Meanwhile, there's also a lot of other cases in this single magnet. So we can get increasingly eccentric from our circular motion. We can go to elliptical motion, or we can investigate linear motion. However, um, these aren't very interesting, and they all exhibit similar uh, modes of motion that we explored previously. So we'll instead move to the much more interesting double magnet regime. So in the double magnet regime, you can see here that the magnet on the, the pendulum exhibits a very chaotic motion pattern. So because of this, it's very hard to quantitatively analyze it with, as with the single magnet case. So instead, what we do is that we use fractal basins. So how do you read this chart on the right here? So each pixel in this chart represents the initial position of the pendulum, and the color represents the final stable position of the pendulum. So blue represents um, it's settling on the right pendulum, while green represents um, a given pixel settling on the left magnet. And this is actually a gradient of color. So we just take the X position of the pendulum and create the plot that way. So firstly, you can see a time evolution of the basin as we integrate the ordinary differential equation across time. 
So what we see here is that um, some key insights are that the ripples are caused by oscillations of the string magnet. So this is a trembling motion that's also present in the single magnet case. And it takes roughly eight seconds to stabilize from the highest initial energies, which occur at the very edges of the plots. Next for the basin zones, um, so this is a very interesting phenomenon that we see in the fractal basin. So essentially you see that there's these basin zones, so big patches of pure green or pure blue. So what these represent is a common path that the pendulum takes towards that end position. So you can see here on this small basin zone in almost the central upper right, so the red square over there, and we see that um, this is a path of a single pixel on in that basin zone. And if we move that basin zone upwards, we see that the path that the pendulum takes to get to its final position stays roughly constant. So it shares a similar path. This is a really interesting observation that we make about the magnetic fractal basin. Next, um, we see first that it's actually stable in this blue region. So that's the basin zone that we talked about. But as soon as it leaves that region, it exhibits very chaotic behavior. So it goes between the left and right magnet at very fast intervals, and we can't predict that um, without this fractal basin. So it's chaotic motion. So now for some um, varying key parameters, we can first adjust pendulum length. So what we observe is that as we increase the pendulum length, the stable zone decreases. Then as we increase magnetic strength, we see that the stable zone increases. This makes sense because the attraction of the magnets increases the stable zone. It's pulling the, mag um, pulling the pendulum towards it uh, um, stronger. So therefore the stable zone increases. Next, when we adjust the magnet position, so as we move them apart, we observe that the fractal basin shifts in very unexpected waves. Especially at the end, we see that there's an emergence of a furred color, which in this case is turquoise. So why does this happen? Essentially, we can explain this using potential hills. So as you move the two magnets apart, eventually a furred um, dip in the potential hill of these uh, in the system appears. And this is gravity. So gravity appears as a furred emergent attractor, and this causes the blue in the graph. So in conclusion, I've theoretically modeled the phenomenon. Um, I've created an experimental setup to camera track the pendulum in 3D space, and I've analyzed both regimes of motion of the problem. Here are my references, and thank you for listening. Fantastic.